were to pay a visit to the average UK household nowadays and go into the lounge or sitting room or whatever they called it, the chances are you wouldn't see a separate hi-fi unit in there anymore. And there's probably not been one there for a decade or more. There might be a Bluetooth speaker perhaps, but that's about where it ends. Now I know the viewers to this channel are a little bit different to the norm perhaps in that regard, but I'm just talking about the average household. And yet for decades there was always a hi-fi in the lounge. There was the television and the hi-fi. We're going all the way back to stereogram, radiogram, music centres, and then on into a stack system, a MIDI system, and then finally things seem to end up with the micro systems. That's from my experience when I used to go around people's houses, the last piece of hi-fi equipment they had before they disappeared entirely would have been a micro system that was usually capable of playing CDs, possibly tapes and mini discs as well. And then when those disappeared, that was it. CDs were shipped off to someone, thrown away or whatever, and they've just got streaming now. Now, I like a micro system and uh, it's a bit unusual because if you read hi-fi magazines or you did back in the day, they didn't really go into micro systems. They were always kind of looked down upon as a poor man's hi-fi, but you can get some pretty nice micro systems or you could do at one point. And uh, that's what this video is going to be about because I've realised I've collected quite a few over the years, a uh, few too many perhaps. In fact, I thought, how am I going to show all these in videos without getting a bit repetitious and saying, oh, here's another micro system? Well, I thought, let's make it repetitious deliberately. How about making May micro system May? And I'll show you three different ones. The first one I'll show you is one of the very first micro systems that goes all the way back earlier than you might think. I always think of them as a, being a 1990s and 2000s thing, but this goes way back. And then once I've shown you that one in this particular video, we're going to move on next time and I'll show you something that's more early 2000s, more kind of typical of a microsystem, although one that I've imported from Japan, which is a little bit unusual to the ones that we might see over here. And then in the third video, I bought a brand new one. I went and got the latest one that you can get and we'll see how that stacks up to the others. Is it better or worse than what you could have got 20 or so years ago? So episode one of Micro System May, let's have a look at the Iowa System 22. The System 22 came out in 1979 and consisted of a series of high quality compact hi-fi components that stacked together to form a very neat and capable audio system. There were four separate but connected parts to which you'd add the speakers of your choice and then you could also pick from a wide range of compatible stands and cabinets. I particularly like the look of that pedestal base at the bottom right and for someone who likes interesting things in cases, that flight case on the left of it, that's very appealing as well. It's the hi-fi that you could fit anywhere in the home or take with you in your camper or motorboat. In Japan, it was known as the My Pace, and it was also rebadged by some German companies, BASF, with their own version, and Vega did one too. Interestingly, by this point, Vega was owned by Sony, so this was really Sony selling an Iowa product. And then there was also the Ua Paco. Initially, I was in two minds about this one, but it's not often you see an orange hi-fi, and it's really grown on me. There's a 2001 A Space Odyssey slash Space 1999 thing going on here, and if you took away the tape deck from this picture, you'd really struggle to pin a year on it, I think. The one I've got, though, is a little bit more down-to-earth. It's the original Iowa model. OK, so here's my System 22. It comes in a nice cabinet as well. I bought this a number of years ago. It's perhaps seven or eight years now. And when I got it, I stored it away for a future video. And I haven't had a look at it since, and I haven't plugged it in yet either. So we're going to find out today whether or not this works. But let's just take a closer look at the front. OK, so at first glance, it looks to be in really good condition. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. There are no noticeable marks on this. All these switches and knobs are present. If we just look from the top to the bottom, we have the cassette deck, the power amp, the preamp, and the digital radio tuner. Now, this was 1979 to around about the early 1980s when this thing was on the market. Having a digital tuner around about 1980 was quite a rarity. I remember getting my first radio with a digital tuner more towards the end of the 80s. So this was really quite high end and just looking at the way it's been put together, 
a lot of metal on here. The only little bits of plastic are on some of these switch caps, but most of this is brushed steel and it feels cold to the touch. It's got a good weight to it. There's one issue with this though, and it's this cabinet. It's hardly holding together at all. All the joins have come apart. I was very lucky to be able to put it upright on here without it collapsing. I'm gonna to have to take all these components out of here and have a good look at that. Hopefully I can get that secured. One thing I do wanna show you though, the power cables. It's a little bit ridiculous. Let's just have a look. Yeah, I'll just spin it around a little bit. Hopefully it's not gonna fall apart on me. And just look at this. This is the cabling for the back of it. We've got four plugs here, one for each component. Now, I would have thought that these things would have been daisy chained together. After all, they tended to sell the set as these four components here. So you'd imagine that these four would interlink with one another, and then maybe if you added additional things, perhaps you'd have to have a plug for those. But no, each one of these has a separate plug. And I thought that perhaps that meant that someone's messed about with this at the back, they've rewired it for the UK, rather than having the Japanese plugs that go from one to the other, they've had to put these things on. But let's just have a look. Yeah, I think you can see that the power leads are coming straight out of the components themselves. They don't appear to have been replaced. In fact, there's writing on here, and it says 1975 ordinary cord Hirakawa Japan. So I suspect that these are the original cables. So perhaps the models that were sold outside Japan were individually powered and maybe the Japanese ones have interconnects on them. I've been unable to find any pictures of the back of these components for the Japanese ones, but um, it just seems a bit weird having this amount of cable for such a neat little hi-fi like this. But let's just take these components out now, get a proper look at them, and we'll see which ones are working and which ones aren't. As far as the cabling between the components goes, it's really quite neat. We've got a DIN cable here on the cassette deck, and that is the only thing that goes from here down to the preamp section. Right, you can see here how, oops, this whole thing is just falling to pieces. These metal bits here that are supposed to go inside the wood and expand a bit. I think they have expanded, but then the wood's just cracked as well. So I'm going to have to try and get all that stuck back together at some point. We've got the three metal shelves and then these sections at the front, which just clip behind the ears of each component and hold them in place. So it's a neatly made thing. I do think it dates the look of it a little bit. I mean, this is very early eighties, whereas I think if you get the components and put them separately, they're gonna look a little bit more modern. So let's just get this out of the way for the moment. I'll try and fix that up later. I just need to vacuum up all this sawdust and then we can take a look at the speakers we're gonna be using. Now they look quite modern when you compare them to the rest of the components, but these were in the catalog as the speakers to go with this system. They're 50 watt, four ohm, got a wall hook on there as well. And they really are of a decent quality as far as the construction goes. It looks like there's a little red LED in there, presumably to show when you're overloading them. Right, so I've got a bit of speaker cable here. So let me just snip some of this off. We'll connect everything together and we'll see if it works. Right, well, with those connected up, it's time to add the power amp, and here it is, and this is a heavy thing. Wow, I'm having trouble lifting that with one arm. Yeah, I know I'm a weakling, but it's a good quality piece of equipment, that. You can just tell they haven't spared any expense with this. Now, if we look at the back of here, you can see we've got speaker A and speaker B, two different kinds of connectors there, and if we look on the front, we've got the switch for whichever set of speakers we want to use, or none at all. Of course, you'd switch them both off if you just wanted to use the headphone output. We've got a power indicator here, set for four ohms, and that's the ohm, and then it goes from 0.1 watts up to 60. Right, so with those connected up, we've just got the input there, which is a single set of RCA phono leads, and that's gonna come from the preamp. So we'll put that in next. Right, so here's the preamp, and on the back, we've got that connector which goes off to the cassette deck, and the output which is going off to this power amp. So we'll just plug the output in first of all. You'd really struggle to find all these features on a modern day amp, as well as our regular inputs for tuner and auxiliary one and auxiliary two. We do have a phono preamp in there, 
and no, we've got a mono and stereo switch. So a phono preamp with a mono switch, ideal for playing those 78s that I demonstrated the other week. Trying to get a modern day phono preamp with a mono button is not easy. Another thing that's difficult to get hold of is a modern amp with a tape monitor. So this is the part that will enable you to record from any of these other sources onto whatever tape equipment you've got connected to this. Now, in addition to those features, we've got our regular bass and treble, we've got a loudness switch here, balance, volume, and then at the top, we've got a low filter and a muting switch, which takes 20 decibels off the volume level. So yeah, very well featured amplifier, that one. And with the auxiliary one and auxiliary two on here, even though this came out in 1979, you'd be fine using it all through the eighties and nineties. You could put your CD player in here, no problem. Right, I think we'll go for the radio next. Right, so we've got our AM bar antenna on the back of here. We've got our FM coax socket, but then we've also got these additional screw terminals. But at the moment, I'm just gonna attach up an FM antenna. I'll see if it reaches. I've got one in this room that's attached up to the window. Yeah, fortunately it's the right length. So we've got our FM antenna on there. Right, we're getting somewhere now. So finally, the cassette deck. Right, well, first off on the top of here, we've got a flap, which if we open up should allow us access to the tape heads to be able to clean them. So that's a sensible idea. On the back, we've just got that DIN socket at the top, which we saw before, that is for record and play. And then we've just got a couple of quarter inch mic sockets on here. Let's have a look around the front. Okay, so we've got our peak level meters here, record level control for left and right, independent of one another, tape selector, Dolby noise reduction, and the input to choose between the microphones or the DIN socket on the back. Piano keys here, but all metal, very solid feeling controls on those. Tape counter, and of course, as all the other components do, this has its individual on off switch. So you don't need to switch everything on if you're just using perhaps the radio, for example. There's a bit of information here. Let's just have a look. Okay, so I'm glad this sticker's here because it tells me that to engage the record, I need to hold down the record button whilst I'm inserting the cassette. That's something I might not have figured out immediately. Now for me, that cassette door is the opposite way round to what I'm familiar with. I'm used to having a cassette with the tape on the left here, inserting it like that into the machine. But of course this one, it goes in the other way around. So you have to make sure the tape is towards the back of the machine as you're inserting it. So it clips in there nicely, jack's fine. Let's see if it plays. Okay, so we just need to plug everything in. Fortunately, it fits on one of these four gang power strips. I've got everything switched off at the moment. So let's start at the bottom, the power amp, lights come on, preamp, radio tuner, and cassette deck. Well, we've got lights, but I think we should start with the ones that are most likely to work. So we'll just have a listen to the tuner. Up here, there's usually a good signal around about 105-ish. Let's go for 102.4, that's not the really strong. Right, this is not this is not a great signal, is it? Okay, well the radio tuner works, but it's not picking up a good signal and it doesn't seem to matter whether I plug the aerial in or not, it sounds exactly the same, so perhaps there's some kind of loose connection there. But at least it's working. Let's move on. We'll go on to the cassette deck next. Right, so I've got a tape here with some YouTube audio library music on, and it's halfway through as well, so we know we're on the right side. Let's just have a listen. Right, do you want the good news or the bad news? The good news is the tape plays. The bad news is it does it for about three seconds, and it also only does it out of one side, look. which is not great. Now, if I hold that down, will it keep going? Yeah, it's the auto stop. It thinks it's reached the end of the tape. Also notice the counter here isn't moving on either. So that definitely needs some work, but uh, what's this business up here? Now, there's a couple of things that that can be. One, it's completely knackered and beyond my abilities to repair, or two, 
perhaps it's got stuck halfway between record and play mode. So let us put a different cassette in here and we'll stick it into record mode. Pop the cassette in that way around. Yeah, this is, it's not that, is it? What happens if we just uh, press auxiliary one? There we go. Right, so yeah, it's still just uh, coming through on one channel, unfortunately. Yeah, I think this is going to need a bit of looking at. We'll try and open this cassette deck first and see if there's anything obvious that's wrong with it. Yeah, unfortunately, this is not an uncommon story. In fact, it's pretty much par for the course for anything that I've taken a look at recently. Whilst it looks beautiful, it doesn't do an awful lot. The radio can hardly pick anything up and the cassette can only play out of one channel for about three seconds. So not an awful lot of use at the moment. I'll see if I can get it working any better. Looks like there's quite a few screws to take out. I think these ears have to come off and then the cover should lift off the top. So let me get on with that. Well, I can see the record switch at the bottom of there, the one I mentioned before that sometimes gets stuck, but doesn't seem to be anything wrong with that. Let's plug it back in and have a play around. There's nothing seems out of place. So all I can suggest is I'll put a cassette in here and prod around with this stick and see if I could get both displays on the front to light up. Right, so you can just see the one there. Oh yeah, I forgot about the auto stop as well. That's a problem, isn't it? What's causing that? I figured out the auto stop is connected to the tape counter. We noticed earlier on the tape counter wasn't moving. Well, I freed that up a little bit. And whilst the belt on it is very loose, there it's moving. It's not stopping. It's carrying on moving. So if I can get this front panel off, maybe I can find out where that bell goes to and swap it out with something that's a little bit better than the one it's got on there. So there's our offending belt. Just need a tighter one of those. Okay, well, unfortunately, that belt is too small, but it's the closest I've got to the original, which is too loose. So I need something in between these two sizes. So I might try ordering something like that, but only if I can get the other channel on this working. But at the moment, taking it off entirely seems to resolve the issue. You can see the tape is still playing. It hasn't auto stopped. And it's all down to this little wheel here that's turning. I don't know if you can make that out, but at the moment it's spinning around very slowly. It's a very low torque on this, so any kind of resistance is going to stop that from moving, which was the problem with the small belt. But as that's turning, it will no doubt be activating a sensor, which is sending a pulse, and the system's designed so that when that pulse stops, the cassette also stops. So if I just touch the top of this, in a couple of seconds, it will activate the auto stop on here. There we go. So the answer is, don't put anything on there at the moment. All we're missing out on is the tape counter, which wasn't working anyway because the bell was too loose. So I'll just put this front cover back on, but before I do that, I'll give it a good clean. It's really got some muck on here, but that's not going to resolve the main issue with this. It's the fact that it only plays out of one channel. I'll have a bit more of a prod around, but I definitely have a feeling with that it's going to have to be something that somebody who knows a lot more about electronics looks through all this and diagnoses what the issue is. Sometimes it's the Dolby chip. That's not uncommon. And if so, that would be desoldering and swapping out again. But uh, yeah, let me just give this a clean. We'll put the front back on. I've got to wonder if this is just dried glue that's on the back of here. And perhaps over the top of this grey section should be a piece of metal similar to the one that's at the top. I wouldn't be surprised. I'll have to go looking at one of those original brochures to see if that's the case. Yeah, I'm going to have to admit defeat on this cassette deck. I have spent quite a few hours today playing around with it now. And the whole channel on the right is dead, whatever you do, whether it's record, play, input on the back, everything. And it doesn't matter if you wiggle things around or prod things, unplug things, plug them back in again, clean things. It's just nothing. There's not even the slightest flicker on that right channel at all. So yeah, I do need someone who knows what they're doing to have a look at this. And that person is not me. And I'm more likely to damage something now if I was to mess with it anymore. So I think it's time to put the cover back on this one and move on to the radio and see exactly why the reception doesn't improve when you plug an aerial into the back of it. Right, well, it turns out that the antenna is working. I've got it on at the moment. You can't hear anything because it's muted, but if I just put this in here... Gold, silent, it is coming through. 
It's very hissy though. Okay, I'm having a little bit more luck picking things up with this telescopic antenna, but it does have to be at this rather unusual angle. And even so, it isn't pulling in stations at the quality that I'd normally expect for a radio in this location. But I am able to pick some things up now. This, however, is Radio 2, which is still coming through with a lot of static. And that's about as good as I can get it. We've got four bars showing up there. So we've got three or four bars out of five. And we're getting a lot of static through. Now there's a button here labeled High Blend and if I turn it on, that makes it FM mono. And of course, quite a bit of the hiss disappears when I do that. But still, it's less than perfect. I suspect it was a lot better than this when it was new. So really, that's another component that needs a good looking at. I think all I could do now is play something into this through one of the auxiliary sockets so that I can get a proper listen to it. Because so far we've got a radio that won't really pull in a good signal. We've got a cassette deck that only plays out of one channel. So really, to be able to listen to this properly, I'm going to have to play something into the back of it that actually works. So let me get out my Walkman. <laughs> Since I've got the cassette deck working, might as well take a listen to it. Now we can duplicate the audio that's just coming out of this left channel over here on the right by pressing the mono button on the preamp. The whole thing's sounding pretty muffled though. Yeah, certainly not a great performance there at all. I've got all the settings in the right position as well. I think it might be interesting to do a wow and flutter test on this, just to see how well that cassette mech has held up over the years. So let me get out the equipment and we'll um, stick in a test tape. Right, I've got everything wired up, so we'll pop the test tape in, press play, and these will take a second or so to settle down. I've got both the scales set to 1%. So that's speed on the left, wow and flutter on the right. We'll look at this one first because it tends to get the reading a little bit quicker than the speed, and it's looking under 0.2%, we'll just bring that to a 0.3 on the scale, so it's the bottom row. So yeah, around about 0.2% wow and flutter. So that's pretty nice for an old deck like this one. After all these years, all the worn components in there, it's still getting a much better result than you get on most modern devices. And as far as the speed goes, that's uh, that looks pretty much dead on there, doesn't it? Let's put it to 03 so yeah, it's just a tiny bit slow. It's like 0.1% slow. Yeah, good results though, I think, for a, an old deck like this. Looking at these specs from when it was new though, it slipped quite a bit from its original results. The wow and flutter was specified as 0.09%, which shows the quality of the mechanism that they used here. Given the age of this deck though, it wasn't designed for playing metal tapes, which were also introduced the same year in 1979. But future micro hi-fis from Iowa would add in that capability, as well as additional features such as presets for that digital radio and soft touch tape transport control controls, depending upon how far up the range you went. You could also add in additional components to the System 22. Over in Japan, you could get a mic mixing unit, no doubt for karaoke purposes. And this thing, which you can see from the top right, is a VHF TV audio tuner, which would enable you to listen to and record audio from the TV. With this connected up, you could be routing stereo television sound through your hi-fi. Now, I do have one of the additional System 22 components, though, so let's take a look at it. Okay, so here's what we've got. This is the MT22. It's the digital audio timer. So this is a clock. 
designed to fit with the rest of the components to turn on and off at the time that you specify so that you can do timed recordings off the radio in your absence. I've shown digital audio timers before on this channel, but this one is specifically made to go along with this set. Now you'll notice first off that that plug there is not your standard UK one, that's an adapter on the end of this one, which is one that could fit in a US or a Japanese style plug socket. And therefore, if we look at the back of this, you'll see we've got two similar sockets on there as well. So the idea would be to plug the other components into here, which would mean that I was right earlier on when I said that they would all be daisy chainable. The Japanese ones would come with little plugs like that, which would fit into here. And we can select the frequency over here. The reason for that is because with it being a clock, it'll be pulling the frequency from the power. And if you had it set to the wrong one, it's going to be running at the wrong speed. And there's our voltage selector as well. Now, of course, one problem with putting additional components like this into the stack is that it will no longer fit into that nice wooden case, but we're not going to worry about that now. Let's pop it on the top and plug it in and have a look. Now I notice this has an alarm, so it'd be interesting to see what that sounds like. There we go. Sounds a bit like a smoke alarm. Certainly wake you up. This is a really nice little audio timer. It's got some good features. First off, nice large digits visible across a room. Although this micro hi-fi is the kind of thing that might find its way into a bedroom and you wouldn't want that lighting up the room all night long. So we've got a dimmer sensor on here to bring that down when the light in the room reduces. It's also got a countdown timer on here. It goes up to 59 minutes. You can see the red LED on there indicating that the outlet power at the back is on. And if we bring that down to zero, you'll see that that switches off. There we go. But in addition to that, we've also got the main timer or the alarm. So I've set the alarm for 8.15 in the morning. So that could wake you up with the beep. But also if you wanted just to leave it in the timer mode, you'd have the switch up there. So the beep wouldn't be activated at 8.15. It would just turn on the outlet power at the back. And of course that would then be daisy chained to the components you wanted to come on. So you could set your cassette into record mode and have your radio tuned into the right frequency. And then you could just flip this thing into timer mode and everything would switch off until the outlet came on at the appropriate time. If you leave it in this sensor position here, that turns the outlet on. So you could just use this as your main on off button really for the whole system. Now, one thing I was wondering was to do with the naming convention. This is the system 22. Each of the components has 22 in its model number. We've got the power amp, which is P22, and then C22 for the preamp, R22 for the tuner, L22 for the cassette deck, MT22 for the timer. What's that 22 about? Does it have any meaning? I thought it might be something to do with the dimensions. So I got the tape measure out, but no, including the ears, these are 24 centimeters wide. If you exclude the ears, the cases themselves are 20 and a half centimeters. So I'm not getting the 22 anywhere. Perhaps it's just purely an arbitrary number. But if you know why this system is called the System 22, well, let me know in the comments. Okay, so after listening to it for a bit, I've got to say the sound quality isn't as good as I was expecting. Now, I think a lot of that is down to these speakers. I think they're getting overwhelmed. If you turn the volume up to anywhere that's starting to get near six watts, they really struggle to keep up. And it's perhaps the drivers in here that are worn out. After all, you've got to bear in mind everything here is really quite old. So it would benefit from having better speakers, but also perhaps a complete recap of all the amplification circuitry wouldn't go amiss. You don't know how many components in here are out of spec and not performing as well as they could do. It'd be interesting to have heard one of these when they were brand new and then somehow being able to compare that to now. I suspect I'm not hearing this at its best. Now, perhaps there's something I should mention here because I know from whenever in the past I've shown something that hasn't been working properly, I'll be inundated by suggestions of where I should send that to. A lot of the comments will be send it to, and then they insert the name of a channel that they like watching on YouTube where there's somebody that repairs things, often at the other side of the world, but sometimes here in the UK. But just because I'm on YouTube doesn't mean I know these people. I don't know them from Adam personally. I might have come across their channel at some point and seen them repair things, 
but we haven't interacted. And I'm sure they don't want me to send them all my broken things. But yeah, that's one way that you could get something repaired. Perhaps, maybe I could, because I might do some kind of collaboration video or whatever. But um, I want you to think of these things as more of a, a general idea. Not my particular unit here, my thing with my problems, but just the concept of an older hi-fi because that's really what I'm trying to get across here. I'm doing three videos, one about an older one, one about one slightly in the middle, and one about a new one. And these are the kind of things that happen with an old one. So whether or not I personally am able to get this one repaired through some kind of contact that I have, just think for yourself, if you were to get one of these and it had the exact same problems that I've got, what would you do with yours? Not what I'd do in mine. Where would you go and get yours repaired? Because I know over the years I've tried numerous different repair places around here and they've all let me down. They've never been able to repair anything that I've given to them. It's always come back in exactly the same state as it went. Or occasionally I've had something that seemed to have been repaired and then a couple of weeks later would die. And that's the problem with things like this. They're old and you might be able to just get them working for a short period of time and then something else will go wrong. So what we're really talking about here is something that's more of a hobby for enthusiasts, for someone to tinker with, someone who knows what they're doing. I think things like this are better in the hands of someone who is able to do all the repairs themselves, because if you were to send these off to somewhere and get them to do them, they're gonna charge you an arm and a leg, especially when it's something that involves taking a load of components out, spending hours upon hours disassembling and reassembling the thing just to fix a little fault inside it. You're gonna pay for all those person hours that were involved in getting that thing repaired. So yeah, I'd suggest, don't worry about mine, my particular thing here that isn't working as it should do. I'm talking more about the general concept of a 40 odd year old micro hi-fi and whether or not it's worth buying. So let's go into that now. Okay, let's try and summarize this. If you were shopping for a micro hi-fi system, why might you want something of this vintage, this late 1970s, early 1980s style? Well, first off, it's the style, it's the way it looks, it's the collectability, it's the solid construction, it's the switch gear, it's something that you might have lusted after many years ago, and finally you can afford. Although, nowadays, these things really are getting up there in price. They're no longer things that people are just throwing out anymore. They're into the collector's realm. But with these old pieces of equipment, you do sometimes get additional features that were then removed from more recent things. For example, we've got the multiple auxiliary inputs on this. We've got a phono preamp. We've got a mono button on that phono preamp. We've got the tape loop to be able to record from any of the different sources. So we've got additional flexibility that was perhaps later on removed. But due to its age, we've only got a cassette deck and a radio. That's not very many things for a set of components like this. I mean, we're missing our CD, missing mini disc. We don't have a record player. Now we can add in a record player and a CD player, but then we're not going to get this nice, neat stack anymore. We're going to have additional components next to these. So really, you've got a micro system, but you're starting to build it out. and It doesn't really make all that much sense anymore. And you're not going to find a CD player that's going to fit neatly on this stack either. Anything you add to this is just not really going to fit with it very well. I would also say that things like this, as we've seen, are unreliable. They're getting on in years. 40 odd years old, it's not going to work perfectly. And if it works perfectly today, there's no guarantee it's going to work perfectly tomorrow. It's very much like a classic car in that regard. You've really got to be into it to want to get one. It's not the kind of thing that you could just get on a whim and go to the shops in. <laughs> Obviously, that's the classic car, not the hi-fi. But similar to this, you can't guarantee that when you switch this thing on, it's going to work. It's more something for your enthusiast to treasure, to look after, to repair, to play around with, to tinker with. But for your average person that just wants a micro hi-fi system that works and plays their CDs, their cassettes, perhaps their mini discs, well, not the ideal thing for those people. So I'd suggest leave this one to the people who really want something like this. And if you just want something that actually works and works properly and is likely to carry on working for quite a few more years, maybe you need something a little bit newer than this. And that's what we're going to look at next time. We're going to go 25 years on from this. It's going to be Iowa again, but it's going to be something from the early 2000s. And that one, of course, will play 
CDs as well as plenty of other formats. So we'll take a look at that one next time. But uh, that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.